Listen. Short story long. Welcome. It could take your whole life. Preach. Develop clarity. Second, patience. If it scares you, you should probably do it. Whatever you think you don't have, you have something else in its place. Ryan, welcome back to the pod. This is podcast number three for you and I. But the first in the... That's true. In the HQ. It's very true. Uh, so first off, let me start with a thank you uh, for doing this three times. Oh, of course. You know, it's funny as you reach out to me and you're like, hey man, you can totally say no, but yeah. like, you want to do a pod? And I was like, bro, I will do 15 pods. If you hit okay. me up once a month and we're like, hey, you want to do a pod, dude? I'd be like, yes. Well, I've written too many books, so I will take advantage of that yes you know but it is it's weird because like you have it is it's it's like it's your thing yeah. you know like it's the person's thing and you're like hey can i come on yeah, yeah. to tell people it's a weird thing it's like inviting yourself over for dinner yes. that's how it feels yes but here's the difference when you are just a content machine you are it's like saying hey would you mind if sometime in the next two months and you're a chef yeah I cook you a beautiful dinner and come over to your house and serve it to you. That's what it's like. That's a good way to think about it. All right. So I thank mean, you. Yeah, that certainly makes me feel better about asking <laughs> yeah. people. And I want to go back and do every book. Okay. We've that done I Perennial can Seller do. and then just a general your story. Yes. But We'll do all the books. Because I just, not that long ago, read Trust Me, I'm Lying. It's incredible. Why don't we just do it right now? Okay. We'll just do them all right now. Just throw all, out the new I'll, 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 give me one of the Young and Reckless shirts. I'll change, <laughs> yes. and we'll pretend that it's a totally Let's different day. Let's just stay here for five hours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, the one thing that I want to say, I want to probably make you a little bit uncomfortable with a, a, a compliment to start this thing. Okay. I've said this before, like probably on this podcast and on my Instagram, but I have become an avid reader probably over the last few years. Yeah. So I've started to read now like more challenging books and books I never thought I would read and stuff like that. But especially for people who aren't avid readers. Yes. Who are just looking to like figure it out, maybe see what this reading thing's all about yeah. and take in some new information. The way that you write books is insanely readable, well, thank digestible. You. I don't know what it is. You but have is a real it? gift. Well, thank, thank you. But I think that's weird. If I was like... Chama, you make clothes that I don't want to immediately rip off my body because they're so no, uncomfortable. It's different. No, no, no. What I'm saying is like, what does that say about books? There's a re Most people True. don't read, not because they're stupid yep. and not because they're lazy. They don't read because most books suck and most books condescend to the reader and or, or the opposite, they don't give a shit about the reader and yeah. they they make it hard for people to do a thing that takes a lot of time that isn't free, you know, unless you yeah. go to a library. Yeah. And so like when what you're saying, like I, I take the compliment, I appreciate it, yeah. but you're also telling me that I did my job. Yeah. That's like my job. And so like as someone who loves books, I get very angry when I read a book and I feel like the author didn't do what they were supposed to do in the way that you, when you, you, you would go to like an expensive boutique or something and you'd be like, just like the stitching in this is bad. Yeah. Just like they, you can see when people took shortcuts yeah. or when people ripped off someone else's thing. Like I see that with books. So yeah. like I write books that I would want to read, but I, I also write books knowing like people are busy, people have shit going on in their life and people are paying me money. And so my book better be, very readable for them. It better help them get better in their life. Yep. And it better deliver a big return on the investment that they made. Yeah. Yeah, I get it, man. You do it well. I, I And I, I always attributed it to like maybe because you're like a young, cool dude. You worked at American Apparel. Like you're not like an author that's been trapped in like a cabin reading and writing his sure. whole life. You know what I'm saying? No, I mean, I do I do think of, I mean. Look, like you have an what, Iron Maiden shirt on. Iron Maiden shirt on. Of course. What author walks around, you know what I'm saying? Um, you're cool. Hopefully a lot of them because they're the greatest <laughs> metal band of all time. But uh, I, yes, I mean, I do, you do have to approach everything that you do with marketing. Like, look, if you're an accountant, you don't get, to, you, you, you will make more money as an accountant presenting yourself as the accountant that 
like makes people's lives easier and that tells them what they want and need. You know, like you always have to bring that to it. But at the same time, like my books are, and I think the reason you like them and and what I tell myself about why they've worked for people, a lot of people I I hear from people are like, I haven't read a book since high school. Or you know, I hear from like professional athletes or really busy people that read the books. It's because I go and read hundreds and hundreds of books from all sorts of topics. And my books distill all that down into a really usable package. So it's like, it's like listening to me, it's like listening to the, like, you know, you go on Spotify and you see like, you're like, oh, I've never listened to Bruce Springsteen before. And you just start with the first song. The, the first 30 songs are good because like, that's all of Bruce Springsteen's best songs. They've yeah. been like filtered through radio yeah. and like movies for, uh, you know, 50 years. Yeah. It's the, the problem is like people just go and they just like pick up a random book that looks cool on the shelf. Yeah. And it's like, they just, they just wrong place, wrong time, wrong person. And that's yeah. why it doesn't work for them. Do you do that? Cause like with me, you're much more of a reader than I am. And, and I read your, um, which I read a uh, ghost ship and last gangster from your Ooh, email. That guy's newsletter. awesome. You should have him on. Yeah. I'd love to. Yeah. He wrote a book you would love. You, do you know who Jerry Weintraub is? Yeah. Uh, he wrote that book. Um, the Way or whatever or something? No, like Jerry Weintraub was a producer of Karate Kid and yeah. like all these awesome stuff. But he um, he wrote a book, uh, You'll Know I'm Dead. When I Stop oh, yeah. Talking, You Know I'm Dead, Rich Cohen wrote that book That's with funny. him. That's funny. I have awesome. it. I've just never read it. And now he's I awesome. Will. Okay. I'll, I'll connect you with him. But he's the best. So do you, like for me, I will not even slightly take the risk of buying a book that hasn't been vetted by someone I trust. So I don't ever just go to a bookstore and grab something that looks interesting. Sure. Do you do that? Is that stupid? Am I being too cautious? No, you're, you're doing it right. So I do, I do because my job is to read lots of books yeah. and find things that people haven't heard of. Yeah. However, for most of my 20s, I probably started this when I was high school, I go to, uh, I would go to smart people, like, you know, or I would read articles about smart people and I would hear, I would go, if I ever met them, I would go like, what's a book that changed your life? And then I would only read those books. My whole life pivoted because I was at a conference when I was in college and Dr. Drew was there and I asked Dr. Drew what books I should read and he recommended a book about stoicism that I would not be sitting here had I not asked that question yeah. to that person and then read the book. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, like, like, look, after you've read hundreds of books and you've really gotten into it, like, take some risks and do some things. But like, like, why don't you start with like the hundred best, like, let's say you're in business, start with the hundred best business books of all time. Yeah. Even if you don't read anything other than that, you'll be improved. Yeah. So I, I think that's the way to do it. And, but I would say some people, they'll buy a book and they'll be because, oh, I paid $15 for this book and it's like not any good, but I'm gonna like gut my way through it. Yeah. It's like, if it's not good, stop. Yeah. And then just buy another book. Like think about a book like a lottery ticket yeah. more than just an investment. Yeah. And so it's like if you buy the book and it sucks, move on to the next book. Yeah. Don't I do that hate reading to get ten more dollars of value out of yeah. this book. Yeah. Okay, so obviously I have to ask you, if if you can only name one book that yeah. isn't yours, what's the one book that changed your life? Okay, can I give you two? Sure. I'll give you, like I said, so Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, which yeah. is like the sort of main Stoic text, that sort of influences all of mine. That's probably the most sort of like inspiring, wise, beautiful, like this is a book to live your life by. Yep. And then if I was like practically like, what's like a real book that's like changed decisions that I've made and like that I admire the craftsmanship of, you know, like that that's like I think about and use in the course of my life, like, Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power is probably yeah. at the top of that list yeah. because it's so, it's basically like reading like 50 different books, yeah. all the best books from history. It's like reading like, it's like a greatest hits. Yeah. yeah that's good. Okay. So I want to get into it because I, I have a million questions. So I told you before we started recording, but for the listener, yes, when I read books, I go through and anything that really stuck out to me that I'm like, gosh, that really hit for some reason. Mm-hmm. I highlight, I put a tab on the page, and then when I'm done with the book, I go back through and I read my tab so that you can yes. kind of filter one time through all the stuff, you gain the main concept, and then you go back and you really soak in and think about those things. And if there's anything really impactful, I, I will write it down, like whether I add it to my goals or maybe I add it to like my affirmations or maybe I mm-hmm. you put something in my calendar or whatever it is. Yes, or tattoo it or Or whatever. tattoo yeah. it on my yeah. arm or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
essentially what I want to do is just kind of go through my highlights of, of the your book? own book okay. with you. Can I say something first? Yes. I think that is also why you really get something out of reading. It's not like, it's don't like, okay, you go on vacation once a year, so somebody buys a book at the airport, yeah. and then they're like, oh, it's cool, but like TV's better. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it's like, no, like instead of reading ESPN on your computer during the middle of the day when you don't have anything to do at work, like pick up a book and treat it like work, like you're getting something out of it. Yeah. And then the more you put in, the more you'll take out. And so yeah. like, yeah, I, I do highlights. I I really digest books. And then I'm I'm thinking like, where can I use this information? Yeah. And because I use it, I get more out of it. And then yeah. I have more time and energy to read more books. Yeah, it's like studying, but studying sounds really boring. It's somewhere in a mix between like watching TV and studying. It's really hard for me to explain how it feels. Yeah, it's like what, oh, maybe a way to think about it is like in sports, they watch game film, they like break, they don't just like, like when Bill Belichick's like, okay, we got like the Packers coming up next week. Yeah. They don't just like put on Packers games, like on, yeah. on a screen in his office and just watch. Yeah. Like they have hundreds of angles of the game and they're, they have like this remote that they, you know, like, and they're breaking it down, they're cutting it in the clips and then they're like... It's work. Yeah. They're breaking it down and and coming, and then they're trying things at practice, and they're going back to the film. Then they're filming themselves at practice yeah. and seeing how they did it. You know, it's work. Yeah. And the more work you put in, the more you get out. Couldn't agree more. Okay, how did the concept? This book is a little different. It feels like. Would you say it's a little different than your normal? Gosh, is that even, how do you, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Let me ask All a better right. question. Okay. How did you come up with the concept for this book? Yeah. And how do you put it in with the series of books you've written? Okay, so the book's called Stillness is the Key. Yeah. And it's the third book in a trilogy. The first was The Obstacles Away. The second was Ego is the Enemy. Mm -hmm. And the third is Stillness is the Key. So they are, it's the same format, the same style. It's a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little bit broader and a little bit, I think it's like the highest level of the three books, yeah. you know, like it, it's hard, it requires you to do more, it challenges you more, it, it, it cha it's like not just mental, it's mental, spiritual, physical, you know, so it's more, but the idea is it fits, it fits in there. The first two books were almost exclusively about Stoic philosophy, which is like a Western philosophy. This is like, how can we take the wisest stuff from the East and the West and merge it together to find yeah. like, the way to live in the modern world. Yeah. And I think what really, what I hope just catches for you, because it should, is it feels like we're in a time where we're forgetting everything we've learned. Yes. We're celebrating outrage. Uh -huh. So media is encouraged to make everything ridiculous, make everything scary, make everything whatever. Sure. Um, there's a lot of people on social media that are making a lot of money. There's a lot of people making a lot of money doing great things, but there's a lot of people yeah. making money just being ridiculous. Yeah, or uh, making you feel uh, less than. 100%. And it feels like, when I look at it, it feels like fundamentally we are forgetting ancient lessons and we're putting ourselves into potential real trouble. Maybe the, the way I would say it is like, okay, being still... Being in control of yourself, having mental clarity, having sort of spiritual purpose. I don't mean in religious sense, just like this is what I was put on the planet to do. Yeah. You know, having like living a good sort of ordered life. Um, all of that is like a primal problem of the human experience. Like it goes back through all history. We've always struggled with this. Yeah. I mean, there's a quote from Blaise Pascal in the 1500s and he says like uh, all of man's uh, all of humanity, all of humanity's problems stem from his ability to sit quietly in a room alone. That was in the 1500s. From his so inability, right? Inability. Yeah, a yeah, guy, yeah. He's basically like, man cannot sit in a room alone. Everything bad in the world stems from that. Yeah. And it's true. Like they've done it more recently. They've done a study and they'll be like, okay, drama, you have to sit here at this table for 15 minutes. Yeah. If you want to get up and leave, you just have to shock yourself. Like give yourself a painful electrical shock. Yeah. And I'd people will not it. do it. Yeah. Like, or people will not sit there. Only 15 minutes. You would yeah. rather feel physical pain yeah. than 15 minutes alone with your own thoughts. Yeah. That's terrifying. So the, the point is, man has always been unable to sit in a room alone. Man did not always have a smartphone. Man did not always have Instagram. Man did not always have the ability 
to buy a plane ticket for $79 yeah. and fly anywhere in the country. You know, man did not always have the ability to go to a pharmacy and buy a pill yeah. that makes them not feel, yeah. you know? And so so it's it's like this timeless thing that's like just even harder to resist right now. Yeah. And that makes, you know, the ability to sort of do like deep work or to to have deep insight or to, to, to manage your life, like, not only more important than ever, but like more of an advantage. Yeah, that's how I feel. I, I literally, I, on my other podcast where I have my two business partners, they, we always joke with each other. And one of the things I do is I, I, I don't have social media at all on this phone. This yes. phone is only work. Yes. And my other phone, I, and this is, I did this out of necessity. My other phone, I leave in my car in the garage downstairs. Oh, that's great. So if I want to go check my social media, which I do once or twice throughout the day, it's like going downstairs and smoking a cigarette. Yeah. Because I realized that even having it in my computer bag, I would just instinctually grab it. My point is, of course, these guys make fun of me and are like, ah, oh, blah, 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 whatever. We're on ours all day. Yeah. It doesn't matter. I genuinely, the more I remove myself from just tuning into the distraction, it feels like a real advantage. It feels like an totally. easy, like if anyone out there wants an easy advantage, taking yourself out of that is huge. Well, and and okay, so you, there's some privilege in what you're just saying. You have to pay for two phones. For Not sure. everyone can do that. Yep. So here's here's like an easier one that I do. So, okay, so my social media is on my wife's phone. <laughs> Nice. Like so, That's so it's good. like if I if I want to take a picture, or I want to share something, I send it to her. I have to like ask for her phone, yep. and so it's like a weird thing. I don't spend as much time on it. That's one way to do it. The other thing I start because I don't have it on my phone either. The other thing I do is I started. I was like, um, I don't want to touch my phone the first thing in the morning. Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. So I was like, okay, can I do ten minutes? And actually there's an app that's called Spar. Yeah. And you do these challenges. Like you there's like you you basically oh, I it's like I it blew it. You sent me one for no, like we'll, show, we'll do and, another one. Okay, yeah. Okay. But so this one, the idea is like, okay, um, I don't want to check my phone the first ten minutes in the morning. So you do it, and then if you miss, like if you do check your phone, it charges you like five bucks. Yeah. So I started at ten minutes mm -hmm. and then I did that for two weeks, and then I got it up to thirty minutes, and then I did forty five minutes, then I did forty five minutes to an hour. And now I don't touch my phone for one hour after I wake up. Not like I touch my phone and then I take a one hour break. Yeah. It's that like I go to bed, I put it in the charger, not in my bedroom. Yeah. And then I don't touch it for one hour after I wake up. Yeah. That gives me one hour of like time with my kid that's not interrupted. That, or that gives me one hour to like write or one hour to do exercise. Like, so it's like the day, I already won the day. Like yeah. the day already had like a big success because I had that focused time for one hour in the morning. So that's, and to me, the book is about stillness. That stillness. Yeah. And like I had one, I had one hour of uninterrupted time just like outside walking around. Like yeah. that's yeah. so wonderful. And it's crazy to me. Like I, I, about a year ago, started not sleeping with my phone in the room. And it is nuts to me how much you pull. Like at first it was like, well, like there's a charger here. Like yeah. whatever. Yeah. Then it was like, there's definitely going to be an emergency. Yeah. What's going to happen when there's an emergency? Yeah. Then it was whatever. So I would wake up. Then when it was out in the kitchen, I would wake up every morning in almost like a panic to get to my phone because I was sure someone died. Yeah. Right. Every night, yeah. someone died and I could have saved their life had I only had my phone. Now, a year later, it's crazy to me to even think that I had those feelings because yeah. sure enough, every time when I get to my phone, I probably wait about 30 minutes. But every time when I get to it, no one's died. There's no emergencies. Everything's fine. But it's crazy the poll... It pulls you like, I used to smoke cigarettes. It yeah. pulls the same way that does. It's so weird. And I think, so it's not just the phone. Because maybe you're like, oh, the phone. It's not just a technology thing. It's the, it's actually, it's the building the willpower to say the phone is not in charge. In the same way, like uh, like two weeks ago, I was just like, my, my wife and I were like, what could, what's something we could like quit? That's what we were thinking about. Yeah. So I quit chewing gum. And not that like gum is not a vice. There's nothing wrong with chewing gum, yeah. really, right? I mean, it's probably not good for you. But like, it's such a, but I was like, I just want to like quit doing it. Yeah. And it, you, I didn't realize all the time that I would just feel a thing and be like, I'm going to, you know, like, cause I travel a lot. Yeah. So I just, I was like, it's, it's like, I'm in charge. Yeah. And, and like, whenever you can take opportunities in your life to sort of like reassert control yeah. is really important yeah. because like, uh, you're in, if you're not in charge, who's in charge, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I think that like one of the reasons I think like having like a physical 
exercise practice in your life, whether you run or swim or go to CrossFit, it's that idea. It's that like, you don't want to do it, yeah. but you choose to do it. And every day it's a battle over whether like laziness or willpower is going to win. Yeah. And I think that's an easy, maybe not CrossFit, but like stopping chewing gum or whatever the person's equivalent is, is a real easy shortcut to a little like self-esteem boost. Of course. You know, because when you notice yeah. how hard it actually is, there's a bit of like a suffering period. Yep. And when you actually accomplish it, you feel like you overcame something. Yeah. And it's a quick way to get a boost. And I mean, how many people can't quit cigarettes because they've really never quit anything in their life? Yeah. Like if you, if pr prior to that, you'd quit some other thing, yep. it would give you, it's about like, you know, in my book about ego, people go, but isn't ego important? And I'm like, no, confidence is important. Yeah. And you fucking earn confidence and you earn confidence with results. So, you know, you're like someone, oh, I'm not a reader. Well, go read it. Go, like find some way to force yourself to read five books in five months or yeah. something, right? Yeah. By the end of that, you, how could you not see yourself as someone who reads books? Like you created evidence yep. that counters that previous insecurity that you had. Yeah. I, that's one thing I highlighted too was the the difference between confidence and ego. And obviously, ego is the enemy is one of my favorites that you wrote. Thank you. Um, but one thing that I really related to is the the problem of connecting too much to your work. Yes. So that's a problem that I had for a very, I still struggle with, that I had for so long without even knowing it was a thing. I thought it was good. Yeah. But I learned that when I would take losses in business or on my podcast or whatever, I would personally feel very, yeah, like I'm a loser. Yeah. I messed up, I whatever. And I had to learn, like this happened in the last year, learning that there is a separation there and how to create that and strengthen that. But how do you, because my normal instinct would be to say, no, you should be connected to your work and yeah. you should give it all you got and whatever. I'll give you like a good fashion example. So at American Apparel, I was the director of marketing for a long time. And, and it was a strange company, right? Because most companies like you manufacture way over here mm -hmm. And you have a marketing firm that markets over them over there. And maybe you have a celebrity designer that did these products. Yeah. It was unusual because it was like they all did it in this one building, right? Yeah. And it was all done by this one guy. Yeah. Like Dove, the founder, was the creative director. He was like the fit model. Yeah. He was like the head merchandiser. He was the majority shareholder. He did all of it, right? Yeah. And like a, a reality of any business, is particularly fashion, is you make stuff and you think you're gonna sell a thousand pieces and you sell 800 pieces. Yeah. And then sometimes you think you're gonna sell a thousand pieces and you sell 20 pieces, yeah. right? Like, and the longer you've been in business and the more you've done it and the bigger you are, the bigger those, sometimes you just get it wrong, yeah. right? Like I have a business and like, w thankfully we haven't had any products that really miss, but eventually we're gonna have inventory on our hands yeah. that we shouldn't have made, yeah. right? And so that happened. But the problem with American Apparel is that unlike, you know, the fashion industry is all about like, the cheaper you make the stuff, the easier you can take the hit because yeah. it didn't cost you anything. Yeah. Like, remember there was that scandal with like Abercrombie and Fitch where he was like, I don't want homeless people to wear our clothes. Yep. That was because people were like, why not just give your extra clothes to homeless people? Yeah. That's what he was saying. Yeah. So American Apparel couldn't do that because the clothes cost a lot of money. Anyway, long story short, basically company was drowning, had so much inventory, like it had... 20 years or 10 years worth of just inventory that accumulated. And these are on your books, right? Yeah. This is, and so like he could not admit that because he had sweated and bled for all these clothes, he could not admit that they had failed. Yeah. And he didn't want to admit they failed because of what that said about him as a person. Yeah. So like, for instance, you know, you'd send 500 pieces to the stores and then it wouldn't sell. So they'd send it back to the factory. And then he'd hear that it got sent back to the factory and he'd be like, what, this is a beautiful garment, and he'd send it back, right? And so now, now he's, he's actually increased what it's cost because he's, you know what I mean? Because his identity's shipping. tied in it. Yeah. So it's back and forth. And there's the opportunity cost. Now it's taking up space in the store yeah. versus something that is selling, right? Yeah. So if you remember the evolution of American Apparel, yeah. right? It's that like the stores used to have like very few products, yeah. and it got more and more packed. Yeah. That's because at one point I was like, Dove, here's what I think you should do. You should take all of this inventory and you should put it in the parking lot and you should light it on fire. Like yeah. it would it would be such a strange thing to do. It would probably get a bunch of media attention and it would be worth more to the company than continuing to pay to store it in these boxes in the warehouse. 
and we're literally choking on this stuff, right? Yeah. But the point is, when your identity is too, like, it's important to care about what you do. Yeah. And it's important to, to, to bleed and sweat over it and, and to think that it's, it's the best you can do. But you also, if, you are too, if your identity is too associated with it, you cannot be objective about it. Yeah. And, and the world is objective. And sometimes it tells you like, Ryan, you thought this book would be good and it didn't work. Or yeah. you thought the right title of this book was X, mm -hmm. but the market has proven you wrong. And now you have to change that, right? right. And so that, that ego makes it hard to do things. And then look, shit happens. Like businesses fail, you know, yeah. marriages fall apart. Like, not nothing lasts forever. Yeah. So like the other thing is like, if you think you're important and worthwhile because you have a beautiful wife or because you drive a nice car, what happens if those things go away? Does that mean you're worthless? Yeah. Of course not. But that's what ego wants us to believe. It's Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy because I felt like my instinct and probably a lot of people's as a young person was that the more you care, the more you are your product, the better that's the yes. passion that it takes and mm -hmm. i think you realize like you just pointed out and made so clear with the dove example the strength comes in being able to do the best you can and then sort of separate from it and if it doesn't work adjust not die with the with a bad run of tank tops you have to be able to to love the process and be present and have that be enough right so it's like i pour myself into this book i spent the last three years working on it I'm now gonna hustle as hard as I can to market it to as many people as possible. I tried to, I, I, I went through dozens of options to get the right cover. I, you know, I checked and rechecked the language on the back. I've mm -hmm. pulled at every favor. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give a month of my life to like the promo tour and all, and, and all of that. But the day it comes out, it comes out October 1st, right? October 2nd, I have to like that. Yeah. In, in the sense that I am no longer in control of what people say, what people do. Uh, look, how many, how many amazing things were discovered like 50 years after they came out? Yeah. Does that mean that the artist yeah. shouldn't have done it? Like you, it's like you it's have- a Sugar Man story. Yeah, you have, to, you, have to, you have to accept that you control all the way up until you release it to the public. Yeah. And then you have to, you have to be able to to go like what I put in, that's the reward, yeah. that's the value. Would you argue that the people who, gosh, I don't even know if you could do this, if you could do some sort of study, like the people who win are the people who take the most shots, not necessarily. Well, it like, depends. Do you think the game relies on you protecting yourself in order to survive for another battle? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. It's like, so, so there's some musicians who are amazing because they put out tons of work. Yeah. And then there's, you know, some actors who are amazing because they've done like four movies yeah. and that movie is everything. Yeah. You know, so I think, I think it depends on who you are and what your craft is and what your strengths are. Um, yeah, I agree. And, and, and so that's another reason also to, to focus inwardly is like we're all running totally different races. Yeah. And if you're comparing yourself to someone, you're like, why are they selling more? Why do they have more followers than me? Yeah. Why are they doing it? It's because they're running a totally different race. You don't know their race might end before you and eventually you'll pass them. Their house of cards could come tumbling down. You could, you could receive the endorsement slash like viral thing of the century the yeah. next day. You never know, just focus on you. That's another thing you write about a lot in there. Like how do you, it's another thing that, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to use this episode to like bash social media, but I do think that this, everything in this book is like sort of the answer to a lot of those problems. So it's yes. gonna come up a lot. Yes. One of the other problems is with social media, it's nearly impossible not to compare yourself to everyone around you, no matter if you're a high school kid in Nebraska or you're us out here. Yes. How do you, is there any fuel? Is there anything good you get from? Yeah. Where so, is it the line? So Theodore Roosevelt's line was that comparison is the thief of joy, Yeah. right? And so one of, the th one of the things I do in my life is I go like, when I hear about like, somebody says how much money they're making, someone's, I just go like, everybody's lying. Like, cause you don't know, cause it's all complicated. Yeah. Like, you know, you hear somebody got, you know, $10 million for this thing, 
But you don't actually know, like, they may, first off, it maybe it was actually only seven and they exaggerated yeah. or the media gets stuff wrong. Or maybe it was $100,000 and $9.9 .9 million of earnouts that yeah. they'll never get. You yeah. never know, right? So it's like, I'm gonna focus on my own business, right? But what I do do is I go, okay, who are the people who have done really amazing work? Not who are people who have gotten really amazing rewards, but I say like, who's done really amazing work? And then I can go, what would they do in this situation, yeah. right? So like when I look at someone like Robert Greene, whose books have sold, like took, there was a slow build and now they're like enormous. I go like, and, and who spends five or six years working on a book. I go like, like if I'm struck, I'm going, why aren't I selling more copies? Or like, why am I not getting paid more? Or like, why is so-and-so more, have more Instagram followers than me? I go like, what would, how would Robert respond to this situation? Yeah. It's like, Robert wouldn't be in this situation because he'd be quietly working at home, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Or I go like, oh, they wanna offer me this cool opportunity. Like, should I say yes? And be like, what would Robert do? Robert would be quietly working at home, yeah, you know? Yeah. So I like having a model that you measure yourself against. And I have lots of other people like that, yeah. you know? It's, and so I go like, what, you know, what, are the, what would the really great people, like what would Muhammad Ali do in X situation? And then, you know, that can help you. So the comparison should make you, should strengthen you, yeah. not make you feel insecure or less than. So would you say that if you find yourself at any time comparing, Gosh, look at their, look at his girlfriend, look at his new car, look at, yeah. end immediately. Yes, or or what I'll do is I'll go, okay, so you like what so-and-so has, yeah. right? Would you trade, not would you like to add what they have to your life? Yeah, that's the big problem, we do that. Yes, we go like, oh, so-and-so has this, but you go also, but their work sucks, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's, it's would you 100% trade places with them? I'm not envious of Donald Trump, and not to make this political, no. but- I'm not envious of Donald Trump in the White House because I know that to be in the White House, you would have to be Donald Trump. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. like, it doesn't seem, not political, it does not seem to be fun to live in the very insecure brain of that fat old man. Yeah. I'm not, that's not what I want. Like, <laughs> yeah. I'd rather be me, yeah. you know? And so, so when you do the comparisons, it, it, you gotta be honest with it. It's, and, and, or think about like, Oh, you see this guy and he's with this supermodel, but it's like, is he happy with the supermodel yeah. or is he thinking about a different supermodel? Yeah. And realizing like, oh, okay. I think the core is it just don't tell yourself, they call it conditional happiness. Yeah. Don't tell yourself you will be happy when you do X mm -hmm. or when you get Y. Yeah. That is like the most insidious lie in the world. Yeah. And as so, I mean, you, I'm sure you can tell your audience, like it's like, You've accomplished things that you would have absolutely killed for yeah. at like 15 or 20 or even a couple years ago, yeah. right? Yeah. How did it actually feel to get it? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't feel like it anything. It feels the same. Yes. Yeah, because you always, the only way I know to describe it is you don't like walk through life with changing states. Yes. You sort of l stay in this bubble and life moves, does that make yeah. any sense? So the goal is to strengthen my bubble, yeah, and that will project me farther into life, because you don't, if you're always feeling like someone has something better than you, I bought a Lamborghini when I was 26, for my birthday. Right? Yeah, what'd that cost you? Oh shit, I don't even remember, $200,000, Okay, right? And I always felt like, gosh, look at all these guys with their cars, yeah. look at all, blah, blah. I'm, I'm gonna get that when I get enough money. The, the week after, I was looking at the person who had the nicer Lamborghini. Yeah. And, and two years later, I bought a Rolls Royce. I was looking at the guy who had the newer Rolls Royce. Like, it just, you always live in that state of trying to get somewhere yep. if that's what's pushing you to get there. And you were anxious about having the Lamborghini. Yeah. It's, not, it's not as fun as you, it's all also disappointing. Did we talk about that? No, no, we should. Yeah, yeah, it sucks. But, but I think it's funny. It's also it's like, how did it feel to grow your beard? And it, yeah. or how did it feel to get how did it feel to get a beard? Yeah, and it's like well you didn't get a beard you grew a beard slowly over time so you, you, there was never a day where you were like no beard yeah. beard yeah right it's a process I would have been hyped yeah when I was sixteen you oh, popped this be beard sick. on my face I'd have been like what as as someone who who cannot grow a beard mm -hmm. I uh, I would but but you're the, envious is what you're saying yes <laughs> no that but but you'd go like oh okay it's it's a process so you never get there. And 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 so the point is not like, oh, so you never feel good, so it's not worth having a Lamborghini or it's not worth being successful. No, that's not the point. Yeah. It's that can you do it 
for a better reason? Like, can you do it on, for cleaner, or can you do it running on cleaner fuel? Yeah. Like, can you go like, I really like cars. I have $200,000. I'm not gonna spend it on anything else. Yeah. I'm gonna buy a Lamborghini, right? That's different than I won't feel like the loser kid yeah. from school if I have the Lamborghini or like, my dad will be proud of me if I win a gold medal. Yeah. No, if your dad is not already proud of you, no amount of accomplishments is going to get that for you. Yeah. If you don't feel comfortable about around women, let's say, you're not gonna feel comfortable around women ever unless you work internally on yourself. Yeah. It, no, being a billionaire is not gonna solve that problem. It might make you sort of creepily able to pretend <laughs> you don't have that problem, yeah. you know? Yeah. But it won't. Being famous is not going to fill the hole in your soul. Only yeah. working on your soul will fill that problem. You cannot solve internal problems with external accomplishments. Yeah. You can still have external accomplishments, yeah. and I hope that you do, but that distinction is very important because people end up, people blow their brains out because they go, yeah. oh, this is all there is? Yeah. And it's like, no, this is what happens when you try to solve a problem with a solution that has nothing to do with the problem. Yeah. Not only that, but I do feel like the, if you truly fix yourself and you love cars and you buy a Lamborghini, that Lamborghini is so much more enjoyable than the Lamborghini that didn't solve the problem, right? So it's like, yes. I think everyone thinks about it like, okay, well, great. So I'm going to become some Buddha Zen master yes. and I never get anything. I live in a rope. Yeah. No, that's, that's like you said, it's not even close to the point. Yeah. But damn it, when you get that car or that wash or whatever it is that you want after you've already done the repair on yourself, then you can actually enjoy it. Yeah. Because now it's just a, it's just a toy. It's just a fun thing that you like to have that truly brings value to your life in that way. Not something that you're hoping will fix your problems or like, like, I think just to be super transparent, I think in those days, not that I regret the cars or the whatever, but like, especially when I bought the Lamborghini at 26, what I was really trying to do was say, I'm not just the kid on the reality show. I'm I have a, a successful business, business. Yes. So respect me. Yes. What happens when you're 26, you're driving around in a white Lamborghini, everyone says, look at this fucking clown. Right. It confirms the stereotype. No one was like, oh, he earned that money. Yeah. They were like, that's reality TV show money. Yes. Even though that's impossible. Yeah. No. But still, it says, if you think, oh, this guy's an idiot, see, he got a Lamborghini, this guy's just an idiot. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't. Yeah, yeah. No, it's Se interesting. Seneca, one of the Stoke philosophers, he would say, a wise man uses many things, but needs none of them. Mm -hmm. So that's the key, right? It's like, it's great to win a Super Bowl. It's great to have a best-selling book. It's great to have a platform. It's great to to have a nice, big, fancy house. Yep. The problem is if you think you need those things to be happy, um, you will be sorely disappointed. Yep. You will enjoy the process of acquiring them less. And frankly, you'll probably not get them either. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it, it, it's just about finding a... a Playing from a pure place is yeah. what we're talking about. Yeah. What do you like? This is, you can answer this quickly because I want to get back to okay. the book, but like when you talk to a lot of like sports teams and yeah. stuff, I just saw you were back in my hometown talking to the Cleveland Browns. Yes. What do you tell those guys? A lot of what we're talking about here. I mean, I, it's, it, it's not like there's some like secret thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the same stuff. It's like, hey, look, like when I was with the Browns, we, what we went through is I was like, look, I drew a circle and I was like, look, here's all the shit in the world, yeah. <laughs> right? And then I was like, those are all the things that you control, a tiny fraction of yeah. all that. And I was like, look, you control how you play. Yeah. You do not control how, if the head coach lets you play. Yeah. You do not control if the GM trades you. You control how you play. You don't control what the ref decides about that play. Mm -hmm. You do decide whether you get in the ref's face and then he throws you uh, a penalty flag, yeah, right? Yeah. You control how you play. You do not control the weather while you play, right? You control how you play. You do not control what Sports Center says about how you play. Yeah. You know, yeah. you control how you play. You do not control uh, anything outside of that, right? You control your thoughts. You control your actions. You control your decisions. You control your character. Yeah. You know, you control the effort you put in. That's it. And so, um, look, that, that, that's as relevant to Odell Beckham Jr. as it is to a college kid, as it is to the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. 
we spend way too much time focusing on things that are not in our control. Yeah. And so if you think about it as a real, not only does that make us miserable, but it's a resource allocation issue, right? So it's like, if you decide I'm today, I'm only gonna put time, energy, and emotions into my own shit, yeah. into the stuff I control, well then you have an advantage over the people who are complaining about what the refs say, or who's waking up and they're, blaming politicians for the economy or, you know, blaming uh, some reporter who said something negative about them, or it's just like, I'm making all this great stuff and nobody likes it, yeah. right? Like, no, focus on what you control, which is how you play, which is the work you put in, which is how you think. Which, and so th that those are the kind of things I talk to sports teams about. That's great. Another thing you talk about in the book that I, I love and, and I've been saying lately is like the comparing your intake of media like yeah. we just talked about like food yes in the sense of sitting and watching a news network or whatever that's all scare news is like just shoving your face with big macs and we have to start thinking of it that way you had cal newport on right uh he he didn't make it no oh no i'm gonna have him. okay good yeah but so cal's Cal, I'll, I'll, since I'm here, I'll, I'll do a picture of his book for yep. him. So in Deep Work and Digital Minimalism, he basically says, like, look, if you sat down to dinner with someone and then you ordered and they were like, they ordered a vegetarian thing yep. or they said uh, gluten-free, please, you'd be like, oh, that's your diet. You choose to eat X and not eat Y. Yep. That's your diet. But then we think it's like ridiculous that you leave your phone in the car. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. or that like, I don't have a LinkedIn account that I know about. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I, the idea, or I don't have Snapchat. I think I do have a LinkedIn. I don't have a Snapchat account. Yeah. Cause I was like, why? Yeah, I was like, I was like, I don't want another thing. Or for instance, I don't respond to messages that I get on any of the platforms. Like yeah. if people want to get in touch with me, they email me. Yeah. And, and that's because like, I'm choosing not to have any inputs. Another one I do is like, um, texts are for friend, uh, texts are for friends, yep. emails for work. Mm -hmm. So like, what I don't want is like, just random people who work for me or or whatever, like trying to get a hold of me. I I when I see when I pull up my phone, it has a text. I want it to be like from my wife yeah. or from you yeah. or from like people that I know that I'm like having conversations with. I want it to be a social thing. I don't want it to be like, don't forget, you have to go to this meeting at two o'clock. Like yeah. I so so it's just like, pick your pick. You pick your your inputs, like yeah. control what's going to come in, make a structure, have a diet, and then stick to it. Yeah. And that's just, I feel like that's such a new problem. It's like we have been told that, which is true to a degree, but more information is better. Be more informed. Yes. Even when I was arguing with my business partner the other day, he said, yeah, but I, I, you weren't up to date on what was going on. I was like, I didn't hardly had my phone. I know very well what's going on. He's yes. like, yeah, but you didn't. I'm like, tell me one thing I didn't know. You didn't know that Diddy went on a date with Steve Harvey's daughter. Okay, great. But I don't even, know that. even if you didn't know what was going on, what did that, how did that negatively yeah. impact you in any way? So like, that's what, like what smart people do, and I talked about this in Trust Me Online, what smart people do when they look at information is they go, how am I going to use this? And if the answer is you're not, they yeah. go, thanks, bye. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. like, uh, like I love watching sports. I had to go like, I'm not going to watch Sports Center because what do I do with this information? Yeah. I don't bet on sports. And if I did, that I should stop. Yeah. You know, I don't work in sports. Yeah. Right. And knowing that Antonio Brown has a foot injury or not, you know, doesn't like yeah. change. Like he's either going to play. Or he's not going to play, <laughs> yeah. and I'm going to be watching regardless. Yeah. So you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like I do. it does, I do. you don't do anything with this information. And the truth is, although we don't want to admit it, and it sounds privileged, the truth is you're not going to do anything with Donald Trump's tweet, and you're not yeah. going to do anything with the breaking news of a hurricane in a city you don't live in. Yep. You know, like yeah, it's true. Like that's the hardest one, I think. Yeah. Because I think people sit, and that's where a lot of this like internet outrage comes from is people just sit all day and read these tweets and concoct. And of course your natural instinct is, I need to do something about this, but there's yes. nothing for you to do. So all you do is tweet. 
So a couple years ago, like when Hurricane Harvey hit, like because I'm in Texas, it sat over Austin and it dumped like a ton of rain, like enough that it cost, like did a lot of serious damage to my house. Not like not as bad as people in, in Houston, but it, the storm affected me. Yeah. So I watched it on the news, yeah. right? And we we were like, okay, do we have to evacuate? What do we have to do? What are the chances? Right? We made decisions based on this information. We went to the store. We bought some supplies. Right. Um, but then, like a week later, I think it was Hurricane Ir- Irma came to Florida. Yeah. I don't remember anymore. Yeah. But the point was, I caught myself watching it, yeah. and I was like, I don't live in South Florida. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I care about the people in South Florida. And if at the end of the storm, it turns out that they need help, maybe I'll donate money, yeah. you know? If I knew anyone in Florida, I would call them yeah. or something, mm-hmm. but I don't. So I'm. this is just shitty entertainment. Yeah. This is entertainment that's making me feel bad, it's making me feel scared, and by the way, I should be working, Yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> or not working and enjoying myself. That's what I've learned about reading for myself is I'll – like, I'll literally be sitting in my house on the weekend, pick up Instagram, scroll for 15 minutes and be like, God, I just don't feel, like, we ever be like, oh, shit, grab the book, yeah. read for 15 minutes, and you feel like you gain something. At least, even if it's an you entertaining did. book, whatever, yeah. you gain something. Sure. It also puts me in a type of focus. It's almost meditative to me. I think that is stillness. You're quietly, yeah. there's no voices, it's quiet, you're yeah. focused, you're learning, even if you weren't learning, your mind was open to learning. Yeah. This is a much better place than, oh, how did they get that? Like, yeah. oh, I want that. Yeah. You know, or like, fuck that guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. That is a bad place to be. Yeah. And it's an it's a natural place to be, but it's not a good place to be. Yeah. It's interesting. I just feel like that awareness, it's an awareness issue, I think. Most people aren't even don't even consider this conversation. Well, to go to the food thing. So like, this is maybe almost 10 years ago now. I, you know, like most smart people try to limit the amount of carbs that they consume. Cause it, and so like I cut carbs out of my diet and I, I very, I do one like cheatish day a week, but like I don't, don't really consume carbs. Yep. So the first time you, I cut this out of my life, it was like, holy shit, I feel so much better, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then, then it was like, I went and I had some pizza and I wanted to kill myself. Yeah. And then I was like, I used to have cereal for breakfast, a sandwich for lunch, and pizza for dinner. Yeah. Like, how many arguments that I have with people, how many times that I feel depressed, how many times that I question my own values as a human, I thought it was like a spiritual thing. It yeah. was just because I was like overloaded with carbs yeah. and I was miserable, yeah. you know? And so it's like, how many people think that, you know, they think these things about themselves because their media diet is making them feel that yeah, way yeah. because they haven't taken they they haven't opted out of it which yeah. is what you can do. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so important. What about journaling? Journaling, I'll tell you this. If you would have told me 5 years ago, "Hey man, you need to start reading more." I'd have been like, "Ryan, yeah. not for me, dude." Yes. Now I read a book a week. Journaling, I'm kind of like that. I'm like, "Bro, I don't know if I could start." So journaling. you don't currently journal at, at all. But you make a good point for it in the book. I recently bought a moleskin. Yes. I'm just wondering if you could sell me. Okay. So I can I can absolutely sell you. First off, basically all of the smart, wise, important people from history kept a diary. I'm sold. Or a journal, right? Yeah. There's got to be a reason yeah. for this, right? Yeah. Um, it's because they had a lot of stress, a lot going on, a lot mm-hmm. to think about, a lot to worry about, a lot of conflicting emotions and forces inside themselves, and they didn't have anyone to talk to about it, so yeah. they wrote it down. Like Anne Frank's diary is not just a collection. It's not just like a historical snapshot into what it was like to be on the run from the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. Anne Frank's diary is a teenage girl trying to work herself through a situation that must have been unimaginably terrifying and awful. And she was also just being a teenager. You know, like she writes about fights she had with her mom. Yeah. And her point is, she's, she goes like, patience has, paper has more patience than people. Yeah. And the, so the point is like, how do you get these thoughts that are bouncing around or they're weighing on your shoulders or they're just like eating away your soul? Like, how do you get them down on paper? Yeah. That's one reason to journal. Uh, another reason to journal is you make big decisions. You struggle with, you know, things at your business. You, you're deciding whether to do this or that, you write that stuff down, two years later, you're making a similar decision. Like a friend of mine just moved across the country 
Um, and he was able to like look back at diaries to other times he'd moved in his life. And he was able to know, oh, this time is different. Something's not working. I have to move again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, am I, he was like, am I just going through like the, the typical, you know, uh, discomforts of moving or is like, did I pick the wrong place, yeah. you know? And so, so it's having a record of your life is another one. Yeah. And then also the third thing I would say, it's a way to keep yourself accountable. So like I, I made a journal, it's called the Daily Stoic Journal. But basically the idea is like, I write about something in the morning yeah. and then I reflect on how I did in the afternoon. So like yesterday I had a long drive from Orange County. I had like these interviews I had to go to. I was tired, something I had to get out that was important. And I said to myself in the morning, I was like, okay, like just your job today is just like take all of this, go with the flow on it. If you're late, you're late. Don't force it. Don't be upset. I was like, my wife's got our kids. So I was like, don't get like snippy with her about it. Okay. Like, you know, she's like dealing with worse stuff than you're dealing with it. And then I promptly like did both of those things, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So when I sat in the evening, it was like, well, why did this happen? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, how could I have been done better? And like, was I the person that I wanted to be that day? Yep. So, and if I could give if to, to, as Gary Vaynerchuk says, to give value to the listeners. <laughs> yeah. the, the, uh, so I think Moleskines are great journals. Yeah. I, I like the Daily Stoic Journal. I, I use it myself. The other one I have, this might be the easiest way to get started. I have a journal that's called a, a one line a day journal. Uh -huh. And it's uh, one page per day. It's one page and it has five lines on it. And you put the year, it has the date and then you put the year. And then you say, like I say one sentence about the day that just went by. Uh -huh. So like I, I was looking at my journal today. I started the Tiger Woods chapter in stillness on this day last year. Uh -huh. So like I, it's like That's I cool. knew where I was, what I was going. It's and and I've done this for three years now. So I have three where I was on this day in history, what I was going through, what I was thinking about yeah. for three years. So it's I, like what they say is like don't try to start some big new habit. Yeah. Like what's the smallest habit you could possibly yeah. start, do that. And so I, you might like this one line a day journal. Yeah, I'm down to try it. I just, I, I see it. I can already see it the same way I see reading where I wouldn't have been able to explain to myself why reading was valuable. Sure. Five years ago. Yeah. I guess it's also just that when you think about writing stuff down on paper, you just think like, so what, now I have extra work to do? So now I got to write an essay about my damn day. Right. But there is something therapeutic about because it, it helps you gather your thought is it because in our head it's just kind of all jumbled around as nothing and writing it down makes it focused or why do you think, I think it is i think that's right so i think the best time to journal though i think in the evening it's great but like you're tired at the end of the day yeah. you have stuff to do you want to watch tv whatever do it in the morning like get up or get up early and and like we're talking about don't use your phone first thing mm -hmm. do this instead yeah you know, like just download what you dreamed about, what you thought about, what you have for the day. Mm -hmm. Like just start your day off right. That might be another way to do it. Yeah. And then and then again, you started the day off by like saying you were going to do something and doing it, which is like how you create momentum. Yeah. You just have stacks of journals at your house? Uh, well, I have the three that I use. Mm -hmm. And then... But what about all the history? They, they just keep them in a safe in the garage. Do you go back to them often? Not... I, honestly, much less so than I thought I would. Yeah. I've probably been doing it for five or six years um, because actually just the act is the yeah. benefit, yeah. you know? And maybe I'll give them to my kids or maybe I'll look through them in 10 years. I don't know. Yeah, I would kill to have journals of when I first moved here. Of course. And of course, that's the one thing my parents told me, but I'm like, come on, dad. Well, yeah, and, and that's the thing. And so we go like, I know I would rather have, I want journals of the past. I know I want to start journaling. But they go like, when's the best time to plant a tree? Yeah. It's like 20 years ago. Yeah. Then it's like now, yeah. you know, so just start. Yeah. Don't, or, people go like, what's the best way? Just start. Like, yeah. seriously, just start. Then optimize. Start, then optimize. And as a journaler, friend to friend, do I, should I, what do you recommend? Do I start in the morning or start at night? What's more I think effective? start in the morning. Okay. I think morning is easier. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Another thing that, this is just a quote that was in here that I highlighted that I think is incredible. The problem is that you can't flee despair. You yeah. can't escape with your body problems that exist in your mind and your soul. You can't run away from your choices. You can only fix them with better choices. I mean, I think 
it kind of ties into what we were saying about the media consumption and just the power of like, once again, I think that there's a lot of easy external blame in this world right now if you want to go find it. Yes. So it doesn't matter if you're, you know, we just had this podcast will post later, but we had these terrible shootings. Yep. Some people are blaming immigrants. Some people are blaming China. Some people are blaming yep. whatever, right? Uh, blaming Trump, blaming politics. I'm just such a firm believer that there's, well, like you said, once again, you can't do anything about all that. Start with you and make your choices better. Start with these small things. Is that yeah. kind of how you see this yeah, topic? Yeah. Or? Um, I mean, Marcus Rios' line is, is, don't blame anyone, but if you do, blame yourself. Yeah. You know? So it's like, take responsibility for the stuff that's up to you. Yeah. Uh, or take responsibility just for having bad expectations, like for, for having expectations that allowed you to be disappointed. I don't mean this about shootings because that's like different. But you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like people are like, oh, it didn't work out or this, this business partner screwed me over or whatever. You could, you could spend the next five years of your life being angry at them yeah. or you could be like, why did I trust this person? I want to clarify. I'm more talking about what drives someone yes. to, I think the oh, shooter yes. Yes, of course. has such a hatred for immigrants and for yeah. these. The blue. problem is you're a fucking loser, dude. Yeah. And yeah. nobody likes you. Exactly. And, and also probably you have severe mental illness that you yeah. didn't treat. Yeah. And like, also, sure, maybe you were terribly abused as a child, yeah. but that doesn't excuse abusing other people, yeah. right? So, yes, right. The, look, uh, I'll probably get a bunch of stuff for it, but like, look, I would say 90% uh, of the people in the alt-right would not be in the alt-right if they got married and got a fucking job. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, the problem is that they have not managed to figure out how to operate in society, yeah. and they think that it's women's, like, they think uh, women are taking their jobs, yeah, yeah. but it's like, no, Nobody wants to hire you because you suck, yeah. right? So, yeah. uh, yes, take responsibility, uh, own your own life, even even if things are unfair, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, okay, be better then. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, be twice as good, right? Yeah. Um, but I think what one of the things that I'm trying to say in that quote that I think is important is people go, I hate my job. I'm going to quit and travel the world, and then I'll be happy. Yeah. Right, or I'm gonna quit my job and start my own company, and then I'll be happy. And I'm not saying you shouldn't travel, and I'm not saying you shouldn't start your own company. Yeah. The problem is, you hate your job probably because you suck, yeah. <laughs> and you're not doing it right, yeah. and you think doing this other thing will make you happy, and you're gonna be disappointed, and you're not gonna be good at it because you're doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. You know, so we have this idea of like, I'm gonna go find myself traveling. No, you already found yourself and you're going to be dragging it along on your trip yeah. and it's going to be really unpleasant yeah. for you and everyone you encounter, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, like there's this story uh, that I tell in the book of Johnny Cash, like his marriage is falling apart. He's basically phoning in his career. He's yeah. a pill addict and he, he lands at like LAX from a tour this is early, he's still married to his first wife then. He lands at LAX for, from a tour and he walks up to the woman in the counter and he's like, I'd like a ticket. And she goes like, to where? And he goes, wherever the next plane is going. Yeah. That so is sad. the same as drug addiction. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But that's what people do. Like they, they just keep going, going. They go, oh, I'm gonna break up with this guy or girl and the next one I find on Twitter will be good, yeah. you know, or I'm gonna like start this, or I'm gonna do this. And it's like, look, it's just, the problem's in here. It's yeah. none of this stuff is gonna fix it. The problem's in here. Another thing I highlighted was the way is near, but people seek it in what is distant. Yeah, it's that's just an like, old Zen saying. Do you think that's, number one, I love when those type of quotes are so old, yes. because it reminds you that it's been a problem forever. Of course. It's a human problem. Yes. But do you think that that's a protection mechanism? Why do we do that? Why do you? Why do we have the inability to truly audit ourselves and look and say, "Damn, I'm an asshole. Yeah. Um, I don't try very hard, and I treat everyone kind of shitty." Why do you say my job sucks instead of saying those things? Do you think that's because we don't like to admit that? Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a if you think that it's you, then you have to do a bunch of work. Yeah. If you think it's them, you just have to say it, and you almost are comforted by the fact that it's always going to be that way yeah. do you know what i mean and even to bash i'm going to go ahead and bash a little a little bit of the alt left okay i think a lot of what goes on now with outrage culture yes. and everything is so unfair there are things that are very unfair yes 
everything being so unfair and everyone being oppressed also isn't the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's catching on now and I hate to see it. I consider myself a Democrat, but I'm saying I hate to see that because it almost seems like this alt-right stuff is causing this alt-left stuff. So now everyone's oppressed or everyone's job got taken by an immigrant or everyone, and it's like none of that, it takes ownership on what you're doing tomorrow morning. Right, and if we looked at what you're doing tomorrow, tomorrow morning it's probably a bunch of bad you know what i mean yeah, like it's tweeting you're stuffing about your face with unhealthy food yeah. you're consuming an unhealthy media diet you're you're not you haven't found the thing you were put on this planet to do you know you're not reading yeah. you're not reading history you know you're, re, you're like you don't you don't know what the fuck you're talking about yeah. so it's really easy to be angry and it's really easy I don't know any person that thinks the solution to a complex problem can be uh, articulated in 280 characters. Um, yeah. That You know what I mean? That's something that weak-minded people spend their time and energy on. They go like, I need to opine on this. Like, yeah. like I, what, okay, what a casino does is know that people seeking validation and thrills and excitement are gonna come in and be like, ooh, I could win money. Oh, look how fun it is to crank this thing, yeah, right? Yeah. Social media does the same thing. Like when Facebook goes like, what's on your mind? Or, you know, like, uh, what's, what are you up to? Yeah. They're, they're, they're exploited. We have two like really deep desires. It's like to be validated mm -hmm. and to be heard, you know? Yeah. And social media goes like, Give me your opinions. Yeah. They matter. Yeah. And it's like, no, you're just shouting them into a void with all the other people shouting them into a void. And you feel worse when you finish. Yeah. And then you all pat yourself on the back and say you improve the world. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, these people actually need your help. You could go do something in real life. Yeah. But you're tired because you just, you know, you just went on this tweet story. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like I don't want to be negative because I don't think I'm sure it's been Similar in all times, there's just been different forms of it, but it feels like it's becoming more and more popular to not take personal accountability. Yeah. Because of Twitter and because of these things, it feels like, or because of outrage culture, or because of racism, or because of any of these things, it feels like it's more popular than ever to not say, I suck at this. I'm going to get better. And that's what I love about the book and the way yeah. you kind of wrap it up. And, and saying that feels like, God, there is so much. E even if the world is very unfair, which I will grant that it is, mm -hmm. even if you have been screwed over or hurt, which we all have, yeah. and a lot of people much more than you and I have, yeah. right? Even if the game is rigged, which it is rigged, you yeah. know, even if all of these things are true, it doesn't change the fact that you're still responsible for your own life. Yeah. Like, that doesn't mean that so that doesn't mean we shouldn't change the system. That doesn't mean we shouldn't improve the system. Yeah. That doesn't mean that some people's calling on this planet isn't to get involved in politics yeah. or to run a nonprofit in the way that yours is to run a, a clothing company. Mine is to write books. Yeah. Like we all have the thing we're put on this planet to do. The, the problem is people think because they, they think like, oh, if I talk about how unfair things are, if I focus on that, then I don't have to be responsible for my own life. But at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own life. And by the way, life is real fucking short. Like I, I wear this Memento Mori ring on my finger. Like life is real fucking short. I'm not going to waste it being upset about things that are outside my control. I might try to fix things that are outside of my control. Yeah. I might support or encourage people who are making a difference but what I'm not going to do is be upset yeah. because not only is that not good for your health, it it ruin it, it it takes your eye off what you should be focusing on, and I think it makes solutions more difficult. Yeah, and I think that like like we said about learning to stop chewing gum or making yourself yeah. stop chewing gum. I think that everything about life, all the great things in life, are about growth and evolution and. And the moment you worry about things outside of your control, you take that power away because you can't grow from a hot tweet. I think what you said about you take that power away is an important thing that, that people, maybe if you feel like, like you've been kicked around, you feel like the system is unfair, you don't like where your life is. Like the truth is every person who's alive today 
comes is the descendant of an unbroken chain of just fucking survivors. Mm -hmm. Like like your grandparents went through, uh, our parents went through the Cold War, our grandparents went through the first, through the Second World War, their parents went through the First World War. Uh, they survived the plague. They survived the Crusades. They yeah. like the war, the poverty, horrible things, abuse, accidents. You would not be here if you were not part of a chain of survivors. It would be it's biologically impossible. Like yeah. your parents and their parents, going back hundreds, thousands of generations, were people who just fucking survived. You have that in you. In the way you go like, oh, it's unfair. Like that guy's dad was an NBA player. And so of course he's good at basketball. And it's like, yeah, but your parents were fucking survivors. And so were their parents. Like yeah. people landed on the East Coast of America and they made it all the way to the West Coast. You know how hard yeah. that is? Yeah. You know, like yeah. they gutted that shit out. You know, they, 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 and, and the people who couldn't cut it they died yeah. and they did not create the next generation. Yeah. So we are, you are a part of an unbroken series of survivors and, and like the strongest people you could possibly imagine. And so like, think about that, let it give you some strength because you have that in you. It's just like, like they go like, most people have all the, bo the body mass and strength to like run a marathon. They just don't actually have the willpower to run a marathon, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's like you have every, you have all the ingredients. You just gotta get them in the right place, and you can do basically anything. Yeah. Marcus Aurelius is like, says like, if it's humanly possible, you can do it, yeah. right? Like yeah. uh, somebody did it, yeah. so it can be done. And this is a conversation I had the other day: is if I, if you said, no way in hell can I run a marathon? Let's say an ultra marathon. Yeah. If I said, okay. Um, I'm going to, every month that you don't run a marathon, I'm going to show up and cut one of your fingers off. Yeah. You'd run a marathon probably on month two. You'd probably <laughs> right. let me cut one finger right. off. Right, you'd see if you're serious. <laughs> yeah. And then so do you it. can do it. Of course it's you just can. about finding the, you, you don't have to, the same motivation. And, and in a way, that should be empowering because you're like, I can, I've just chosen not to. Yeah. And so now I'm going to choose to. I like, I, I heard this, I forget where it was, but it's something that stuck with me that go like, because I say things like this all the time. I'm like, we'll buy some furniture at Ikea. And like, I'll be like, I'm not good at assembling Ikea furniture. Yeah. So maybe I'll pay someone to do it or maybe my wife will do it. But like, why did I say I'm not good at it? It's I've chosen not to be good at this thing. Yep. Like, so I don't feel bad about it anymore because it's like, oh, that's just not a thing I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But I don't go walk around like adding to my identity that I'm like incompetent. You know, like, of course I could. I've just chosen not to. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like... But you should try to live a life where you're actively challenging yourself to choose to do hard things. Well, I mean, this is coming from a guy who lives on a farm and like wrangles bulls and stuff. So. Not, not quite, but yes. <laughs> I, I, like one of the, I, tried to, I try to live a life that's like active yeah. and challenges me and then puts me, I think comforts the enemy, you know? Yeah, big time. Okay, so I, one of the last quotes that I highlighted and we kind of touched yeah. on it was, build a life that you don't need to escape from. Yes, I think it's incredible. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question that could be kind of cheesy, but I want the real answer. Okay. Um, with this book, what do you hope? I mean, I know that on October 2nd, yeah. you wipe your hands yeah. and you let the world. What do you hope happens? Other than the yeah. money and the record sales and all that. <laughs> sure. What do you hope happens when you put something like this out into the world? So what I what I hope is that I don't want to say like confirmed, like, because I need people to tell. I hope that, and I don't even want to say I hope it's seen that way, but it's like my success for me would be some confirmation that it really is the best thing that I've done. Like everything yeah. I do, I try to go like, this is the best I was capable of doing. Yeah. So I'm not saying I like, I want some random guy on the street to be like, it's your best work. But I go like, what do people who I really admire, yeah. whose opinions like mean something to me? Because like, it's clear they have good, like, it's clear that they have, ev there's justification for their opinions, yeah. you know? Like, they've earned that respect. If they're like, it's good, you know? And and the best way I found to get that, and the most validating thing as an author, is when you hear real people who do real things yeah. go like, this helped me with what I'm doing, yeah. you know? 
Yeah. To me, that's success. Well, and put that's me a on little bit dependent. That's a little helped bit. me. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And and you you uh, you're not the president, but you like. I, I'm pretty close. You know, you ha you do real stuff. Yeah. You have real yeah. responsibility. You're doing things at a high stake. So that's what you're looking for. Yeah. And like to me, that's not completely in your control. Like, yeah. but like a lot of people said, you know, Moby Dick was a shitty book, right? Yeah. But like, it is kind of in your control to like make something good. Yeah. And I also just think, I mean, like fundamentally, if you're playing basketball for 10 years, you want to know you're getting better. Yeah. You know, yeah. You don't wanna... I mean, the benefit is you can see the shots going in. Yeah, exactly. Right? That's what I'm saying. On this, yeah. you don't. Right. So what if on year 10, they're like, hey, by the way, your baskets haven't been making it in. You're yeah. Like, Fuck, what are we doing right. here? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Here's my last three enders. Okay. I added a new one. Usually there's only yes. two. Number one is, what is one habit or routine that you do that has changed your life or is responsible for your success? Or, you know, I'll has give you a, three. Has a play uh, three there's three things I think people should do every day. Okay. These are really simple things. I think they make three every day a win. Okay, so I think they should journal. Mm -hmm. So take some time to write in a journal, get your thoughts on paper from your mind. Yep. I think you should go for a walk. Yep. Quiet time where you do nothing. You're just walking around. You're in nature. You're outside. Do your phone... Do a phone call on the walk if you don't have time to just go for a walk, yeah. right? So, like, go outside, experience nature, walk, and have this sort of movement through stillness, right? Even, stillness through city, even if I live in a city? Even if you live in a city. Yeah. Take a walk around a parking lot, look at the ground, Great. you know? <laughs> and the last one, and this is seems the same as, as walking, but it's different, have some sort of strenuous exercise that you do. Yeah. If you take care of your body, your mind and your spirit will be better. You'll have ideas. Um, have some... Where you're doing something there's no screens yeah. you know like i love swimming because there's no screens yeah. and you can't hear anything and you're staring down yeah. and you know and i love that like the reason i think you need the exercise is like you can have the shittiest day at the office you could get uh you know uh the worst sales report of your of your business yeah. but you lifted you know a, a pr you know, yeah, yeah, on yeah, your yeah. deadlift. Yeah. Or you you just had a really good run. You yep. had like 30 minutes of winning. Yep. And so give yourself that every day. Yeah. Huge. Okay, next one. You can hop in a time machine. You can go any to any point in your own life and tell yourself anything. Where do you go and what do you say? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, thankfully I don't have any moment where I was like, did this and yeah. it totally blew it. Yeah. But I can think of th two or three occasions where I was like, there were business decisions that I was making and and I went, I sat, I talked to my wife about him, and I was like, I want to do this. And she's like, that's not a good idea. Don't do that. Yeah. And I said, you don't know what you're talking about. And I did it, and it was a horrible mistake. Yeah. So I basically just, if I could go back, I'd just be like, hey, your wife backs you on pretty much everything. Yeah. On the rare occasions when she doesn't, it's probably because you're not seeing something. Yeah. And I think that's a critical thing. I mean, you know, we talk, we in the sort of empowerment movement that's been going on, we go like, don't listen to haters. Don't listen to doubters. Sometimes someone is yelling at you because they don't want you to drive off a cliff. That's so you know? hard to tell. I know. You know what I mean? That's, that's yes, you got to do some work. Yeah. But instinctually listening or instinctually not listening, yeah. both bad strategies. Yeah. yeah, you're right. It's not as easy as all or nothing. No. Okay, last one. It's kind of similar to the one you already said, but if you could prescribe anything to the entire world, for 30 days and they have to do it. So I guess it's different because yeah. those are more habits. Yeah. This is more what you prescribe it to the entire world for 30 days. They all have to do it. And obviously you're ho hoping that there'll be some positive outcome. I would give them some work of ancient philosophy, probably a collection of different things, but I'd go look. And this goes to the thing we're talking about, about the importance of reading. For 5,000 plus years, really smart people have been thinking about all the problems of the human experience. Yeah. And they've tried a lot of things out, you know? Yeah. And they came to some interesting conclusions yeah. that are confirmed by Eastern philosophy, Western philosophy, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Confucianism. They all basically come to the same conclusions, right? Power of stillness, the perils of ego, you know, the power of the mind to choose how it sees things, you know, all. So maybe instead of doing all this by trial and error yeah. and bumping into really painful things along the way, maybe we should benefit 
uh, ourselves of that wisdom. You know, like I say in ego, there's a line, uh, it, this guy says like, any fool can learn by experience. I prefer to learn by the experience of others. Yeah. Tolstoy's line was like, I don't understand people who do not have conversations with the wisest people who ever lived. Yeah. That's what philosophy is. That's what wisdom is. You're an idiot to not take them up on it. Yeah. It's free. It's for free on the internet. Yep. You know, it's free at any library. Yeah. Or it's ten dollars. You can carry it around for the rest of your life in yeah. a book. Do it. It's so crazy to me that when you when we talk, because one of the other things I wrote down in the notes was the line of that you can talk to the most uh, intelligent people in the world or whatever, but uh, or in history. It's almost crazy to hear you say it and think that for 5,000 years, people have been saying, hey, this yeah. is true. Yes. And we keep repeating. We do it over and over. And every generation yes. has a different way of saying, hey, these are the truths. And then and they're all the same. They're all the like same. Essentially, the, even like religious, even the Bible, even even, like they're the, all fundamentally similar. Even the neuroscience that we are yeah. researching is like, oh, same thing, you know, accomplishments don't make you happy, you yeah. know, or whatever. Yeah. Like, uh, it, so it, it's, it's, so, it's so simple, yeah. but we won't do it yeah. because we're afraid, because we don't think we're worth it, you know, because it's hard. That's interesting. Okay, listen, Ryan, uh, not only thank you for coming on the pod, I literally, anytime you're in town, I... We'll want to it? sit and chat about every book. Well, we got like seven more to go. So. I'm saying I will do every one. All right, and done. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for the book. I think, uh, I think it's going to explode, man. I think Thanks. that there is a group of people that understand that this is needed more than ever, and they're going to grab onto this thing. And uh, you got a hit on your hands. Well, I'll take it if it happens, and uh, I'll be working on the next one if it doesn't. Either way. Either way. <laughs> Thank you, man. Thanks, man. We did it. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it, as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.